Goli is the musical duo Valerie Thompson and Vesela Stoyanova. Vesela grew up in Bulgaria. Uh, Valerie said that she is Bulgarian, and Valerie grew up in Kansas City, and she is Kansas Cityan. <laughs> <laughs> they came to their instruments in a parallel way, it seems, sort of a prohibition of <coughs> instruments uh, when they were around 10 or so, those formative years of uh, beginning um, to play an instrument. And uh, for Valerie, she was interested in playing saxophone like her father, and uh, her mother would have none of that. So she needed to choose again an instrument. And so she wanted the upright bass at school, but the girls were not able to play them at the age of 10, so she went for her next biggest instrument, the cello, <laughs> and has been playing it ever since. Vesela in Bulgaria uh, was taking piano lessons with her mother, who was a performer and teacher. And uh, during a heated lesson between mother and daughter, which uh, sometimes happens uh, when teachers, parents are teachers, um, and it wasn't going quite right. Uh, the piano was locked up, and Vesela was not able to play piano again. And her mother told her uh, instead she needed to go and pick another instrument. And so they went to the store, and Vesela looked around and chose a drum set because it would be the loudest next <laughs> instrument she could play. <laughs> Eventually, she moved on to marimba, which she'll be playing with us today. And when asked, why do we need songs, uh, Valerie gave me this quote. All the mundane and idealized things we can experience in our lives can be expressed in music from sophisticated to pedantic. It all exists in songs. Sometimes those emotions being expressed can have a catchy hook or a danceable beat, and that can be a fun celebration of all the mundane and magical things we encounter in life. So I look forward to what you will share uh, and celebrate with your voice, as well as marimba and cello. Please help me give warm morning welcome to Goli.
answer on the windowsill. Do you have the answer? Dusty tome upon the shelf. Can you get what I'm after? Tiny star in the big blue sky. Tiny star in the big blue sky. A tiny star in the big blue sky. Can you tell me when I'm going to die? Cause I should probably see my parents before they end. Go climb the Great Wall of China and I'd really like to kiss a million men. Or at least 11. Gotta get my life all sorted. I've gotta get those pages bound. I'm gonna climb to the highest hillside before I can crash and hit the ground. Ian surely went to heaven and Ryan got laid in his hospital bed. VJ will always have the scars on the back of his neck and the back of his head. And the tumor may not kill them, but someday they'll die. The tumor may not kill us, but someday we'll die. The tumor may not kill me, but someday I'll die. More. Not knowing is the price we pay. Jean was a model teacher, making music with the students she had. 88 years and the symphony ended. I never told her how her hearts bled. I never told her how her hearts bled. I never told her what she meant to me. And when we pass away, I wonder what they'll say And I hope that when it's my day You'll say what she lacked in grace She made up for with enthusiasm I should probably read the Bible before I die And make love in an elevator And I can say that I've jumped from a plane But if I cannot die happy Then at least I could die in your bed. Thank you guys so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, the first tune that we did was an original composition that Vessel wrote called Gypsy Road, and that last song was one um, that I wrote, and I think they're both kind of autobiographical in a sense. Um, being from Kansas City, perhaps I could have written a tune like that first one, but I think it's awfully fitting that Vessel from Bulgaria did. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's a, it's a chilly winter morning, and um, I don't know about you guys, but my fingers are a little cold. And if your fingers are a little cold, I was hoping maybe you could join us on this next tune. So during the chorus of this song, what I'd like you to do is if you can clap or snap your fingers on beats number two and three, You'll know it's the chorus because we're going to start with it and it'll happen a lot as all good choruses do. Um, but it might be a way to kind of warm your bodies up this beautiful wintry morning. So it's going to go a little something like this. Yeah, go ahead and get your hands out of your pockets. You can clap if you want to. Some people can snap. It's okay. I've got ghosts and imaginary friends. I've got ghosts and imaginary lovers. Oh, I've got ghosts and imaginary friends. And I think I'm starting to like them. I've got ghosts and imaginary friends. I've got ghosts and imaginary lovers. Oh, I've got ghosts and imaginary friends. And I think I'm starting to like them. It happened on that day. It was dark and it was cold. And it was cold and it was dark out. My parents were away. And when I cried out, a strange voice answered. How are you, Miss Valerie? I can tell by your stature, you're lacking adventure, you really should get out more, dear. Those voices you're hearing are not on the outside. Cause I've got ghosts and imaginary friends, I've got ghosts and imaginary lovers, I've got ghosts and imaginary 
imaginary friends And I think I'm starting to like them My oldest ghost is far too old for me to be thinking These thoughts about his body, my youngest ghost She's beautiful, gentle and kind and insanely pure I'm starting to like them. The doctor says she's far too young to have that distant look in her eye. The doctor says she's come undone. We should be careful because she might hurt someone. I've got ghosts and imaginary friends. I've got ghosts and imaginary lovers. I've got ghosts and imaginary friends. Starting to like them. My tallest ghost, he's not so tall that he can reach the top shelves of my pantry. My shortest ghost, he's not so small that I can carry him when my hands are full. My fattest ghost, she's not so fat that I can't leave her at home with the chocolate. My thinnest ghost, he's not so thin. That I can see through him when he turns around Because I've got ghosts and imaginary friends I've got ghosts and imaginary lovers I've got ghosts and imaginary friends And I think I'm starting to like them The doctor says she's far too young to have That distant look in her eye the doctor says she's come undone We should be careful because they might hurt someone Doctor says there is no cure The patient is despondent and lacking in funds The doctor says there's just one chance Give her these pills to make her feel better Give me these pills to make me feel And imaginary friends I've got ghosts and imaginary lovers Oh, I've got ghosts and imaginary friends And I think I'm starting to like them I'll lose those ghosts and imaginary friends Who needs those ghosts or imaginary lovers I'll ditch the ghosts and imaginary friends Cause they say they're starting to harm me I've lost my ghost, I've lost my ghost, I've lost my ghost, I've lost my ghost, I've lost my ghost and imaginary friends, I've lost my ghosts and imaginary lovers, I've lost my ghosts and imaginary friends. Starting to miss them. I think life is an amazing, beautiful, and very serious and completely irreverent thing that we get to experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think uh, I think that's something that I, we both bring to our music. Reverence and irreverence. Um, I wanted to let you know, uh, goli is a Bulgarian word. It comes from um, an irreverent toast, chistu goli, which means bare naked. Um, so the play on, you know, we're more naked than naked when we wear all our clothes is that technically it means naked in Bulgarian. But we think of that as a, it does. <laughs> we like to think of it in artistic manners and we're burying our souls. Of 
abundance We had hope for everything Cause we didn't have much else We had everything once We had dreams of abundance We had hope for everything Cause we didn't have much Thank you. So we're going to do one more song for you guys today, and we want to let you guys know if you're around um, 
If you're around in the next few weeks, we'll be playing at Club Passim on January 23rd. That's a Sunday night, and we'll go on at 8 o'clock, so it won't keep you out too late. Um, and then we'll also be playing at Nick's in Worcester on January 28th, and that's, good. that's a great little place in Worcester if you guys ever make it out there. Um, thank you guys so much for listening, and thank you so much, Cheryl, for having us and everyone here at HCAM. Um, it's been a real pleasure. So we're going to leave you with a little more irreverence. We're goalie. This is Vesla Stoyanova on the marimba, and I'm Valerie Thompson, and this is the cello. Thank you guys so much. It's not our love that keeps us together. It's not our strength that binds our two lives. It's just the fear we have of living forever, of living forever. Don't want to be alone. It's not because you kiss me at bedtime It's not because I wash all the clothes It's just because We fear living forever They say it's much better To stick together Don't want to be alone Be alone Be alone As pretty as I am I could have done better as handsome as you are, you know you could have done better. It's just the fear we have, there's nobody better. It keeps us together, or maybe forever. Don't want to be alone, be alone, be alone. We would grow old and we would get ugly. You would get impotent and I would get fat. You'd grow out your nose hairs and I would get angry. And in between the arguments, we could say with confidence, at least we're not alone. At least we got each other. At least we're not alone. Like those losers next door. At least we're not alone. At least we got each other. At least you're not alone They say when you're alone You can never be happy They say when you're together You can never be free Well if I can't have it all I'd rather have nothing Give me nothing Give it all to me And now we are alone All alone together and now we are alone, and we're lighter than feathers. I guess this is alone, all alone together. If this is alone, then I can do this forever. If this is alone, then I can do this forever. It could be worse, at least we're all cursed together. If a here is alone, then I could stay. Thank you guys so much. And I am truly going to the mundane because I'm reading a poem about grocery shopping. <laughs> I wanted to see if it could be done. Okay. Moving through the big market. Sensual pleasures are the start of the grocery shopping experience. The smell of a ripe cantaloupe, the heft of sweet potatoes, fuzzy peach skins, and shiny peppers. At the fish counter, I exchange quips with the white-jacketed man who looks like Morgan Freeman and recommends wild Atlantic cod. I pick up some unnecessary bargains in the sa sale aisle and score some aromatic, fair-traded French roast, $2 off. In the cereal aisle, the primary bright boxes offer such a plethora of choices that it's like too many clowns coming out of one car. By the time I get to the laundry detergent, I want out. I feel hungry, and everything is so expensive that buying chocolate milk seems like a luxury and a fattening one at that. When I finally roll into the checkout line, I'm hot, and I forgot eggs. But who cares? 
Not the bag girl who is smiling and talking about getting out at three in time to go swimming. Not the cashier who hands me a receipt that is 20 feet long and wishes me to have a good day. It is a good day. I have food. And even though I can't make omelets, I can and do drink cold brown milk, guzzling like a pregnant woman from the gallon jug right in the parking lot. Thank you. <laughs> The poem that I'm going to give you is in German. Anybody here speak German? Not a one. Great. <laughs> uh, and so I'm going to recite it in German. Uh, but as I say, you all know it in English. But because it's in a language you don't know, all you can really do is sit back and listen to the music of it. And maybe that will be a, a new experience for this poem that you already know. The name of the poem is Der Jammerwoch. And it, the first line might give it away. Es brillisch war. Has anybody got it yet? <laughs> okay, let me give you the poem. You'll, you'll catch on soon enough. Uh, uh, well, I'll just tell you the uh, es brillisch war means twas brillig. <laughs> now you all have it. Es brillisch war. Die schlichte Toven wirten und wimmelten in Waben. Und alle mümsige Burgoven, die Momenrat ausgraben. Bewahre doch vor Jammerwoch die Zähne, Knirschen, Krallen, Kretzen. Bewahre vor Jubjubvogel, vor frimiösen Bendesnetzchen. Er griff sein Worpelschwertchen zu, er suchte lang das manchsam Ding. Dann, stehend unten Tumtum Baum, er anzudenken fing. Als stand er tief in Andacht auf, des Jammerwochens Augenfeuer durch Tulgenwald mit Wiffe kam, ein Bürbel nun geheuer. Eins, zwei, eins, zwei, und durch und durch das Worpelschwert zerschniffer schnuck. Da blieb es tot. Er, Kopf in Hand, geläumfig zog zurück. Und schlugst du ja den Jammerwoch? Umarme mich, mein böhmisches Kind. O Freudentag, o Halluschlag, er kortelt frohgesinnt. Es brillisch war, die schlichte Toven wirten und wimmelten in Waben, und alle mümsige Burgoven, die Momen rat ausgraben. She had spent the late afternoon with her only grandchild on the night she died. She still had her half glasses on as she retired to bed, resting her head on the pillow as if expecting to rise again, get up as she had always done and prepare another meal of roasted potatoes, lamb, and a village salad, tend once again to the family she had raised alone, a family held together by her pride and tenacity. But 
As her eyes closed to half-mast, she knew her life's work was complete. She had seen her three children go to college and watched as each became established in well-respected professions. She anticipated her granddaughter's departure for college by summer's end. Over the years, her children visited daily, coming to her in shifts so she wouldn't be alone for long stretches of time. They wanted to buy her things, but she disdained flamboyant gifts and birthday presents and Mother's Day cards. She told them that the family was all that mattered to her. She was 74 and alone on this night, as alone as on the day she watched her husband leave for a new beginning overseas. She lived with in-laws that ruled her as she waited to hear from him. She rode out on a mule ten years later from her village and started her own voyage across the ocean. She left behind her village costumes and cedar chest expecting to return home someday. She would never see her mother again nor her younger sister. She spent the years following and supporting her husband just as women in her family had done for generations. She buried her husband in the prime of her life. She took on the role of creating a world for her children once their caretaker was gone. She weaved out a tapestry, spun the threads that gave each of them an opportunity to escape the poverty she had known. She retained her core as her children grew, as they reached for status and power and comfort. She embraced a dress that was her mother's and grandmother's as the children absorbed a new world with its own myths and rules. She continued to move among a small circle of friends and relatives, never becoming transformed by a culture that glorified materialism and freedom. She retained her identity and affection for an ancestral village that over the years turned into an irrational reverence. Her children would come to pine for the very centeredness their mother had always known, regretting their freakish lives as they straddled two worlds. On that day in late summer, when her oldest son found her still body, her glasses resting on the pillow, he called out to her for the final time. His plaintive wail was the only sound heard on this quiet afternoon. Her aged body had been stilled as she slept, bringing to an end her final years, years that had seen her become a bystander, a witness of what her family had become with her guidance. Resting peacefully in her bed, she appeared to be dreaming of a far-off place with fig trees and lemons and pomegranates and the aroma of fennel-flavored liqueur drifting upward toward the mountain peaks. She was back home in this dream, back to see her father and mother. She would no longer roam to worlds full of sadness and loss. We have warmed ourselves with wonderful words and song this morning on this very cold January morning. So I want one more time to bring you down to the rainforests of Ecuador where it is wild and green and warm and where I was a year ago today. And uh, I have a picture here for you of the Payan de Diablo which is the Devil's Cauldron and it's located near um, Banos, near the uh, Rio Verde. It is an Incan or an old ceremonial site, actually probably predating the Incans, from the heart of the world, the Vitad del Mundo. So this morning, my poem is entitled Shaman's Call. The shamans are the medicine men who stand at the gateway between human and nature. Shaman's voice the forest calls, raining down upon us all the far-flung sound of nature's fall. At our feet the invite sings, waiting for our minds to bring it to fruition. Among the tribes of people, waiting in their wisdom, teaching us their language, spirit guides to recognize, we hesitate and falter cannot conceive or alter our state of being deep implanted 
to receive an older knowledge in the arms of oneness, in the spirit of the living things before we came to be. How we struggle to see and hear and connect to threads broken by long neglect. Deep in our spirits go, gaze at pools of knowledge known. Reach and listen, look and sense what is there beyond conscious consent. To places where still we go about, with older wisdom shown within the gleaming point perceived when first the shaman's voice received. A forest calls, and earth lays weight upon the frailness of this gate. Go to the places in your heart where once you heard them speak and listened childlike in your sleep. Thank you for listening to my words. Mother's turning 90. What a gift to have her here. Although she's very limited, she still is very dear. She's mostly in the moment and content with very little. But no matter how many visitors, she still loves being right in the middle. Although a pretty new scarf delights her to no end. She only keeps it for a moment and then passes it to a friend. Her presence is a reminder. We only have this day. Enjoy what is and then let go with whatever comes our way. Thank you. My first poem I'm titling, Concealed by a Mist. There's a faraway gaze in your glistening eyes, and an encroaching haze makes it so difficult to breathe, so difficult to witness you disappearing in grief. With your empty shell beckoning my heart, I feel a pull that you cannot receive. And though I sit by your side, you are lost, lost to me, not a glimmer of light penetrating the fog. So I chase the pull down the darkening cryptic abyss to lower a gossamer line from my chest, something to climb should the sorrow allow escape from the mist. But you are gone, too gone, to reach for my ministering heart, which begs to know upon what hidden torments you dwell, as if I can't guess what lover's quarrel has made for your hell. Only departing love silences so well. I grieve as you grieve, and you grieve, and you grieve. Yet I have to believe that you'll see through your man-made veil and ascend when you can on the ladder I dangle. It seemed that he kindled your life for a time, but in truth it is you who must keep your own light. And my next poem I title, Lucilius's Valentine for Modern Man. You purchased at the beauty parlor everything above the collar, hair extensions, fair complexion, eyebrow lift, collagen lips, whiten teeth. For a like amount, you could count on buying a new identity. And my last poem is Wrapped in Your Love, which is for Mark Stefakoff. Except there, where the pines scented the air and their needles softened my path, where the campfires crackled and lit up the faces of summer friends singing of deep woods and lakes, I didn't think of you much while growing up. Except when my grandmother, whose arms wrapped around me like feather, feather pillows draped in velvet, who always smelled faintly of chrysanthemums, and who rode in the back seat of the car with me, stroking my hair, died. Then I knew you were there because she couldn't be just gone. Except after a time she felt gone and life was hard and I didn't think of you much until my daughter, who rushed from my loins, drew breath and lay on my chest softly and warm 
and I wrapped my whole being around her and was sure you had to be there because she was there. More children than after a time I was crippled with pain and life was hard and I wasn't so sure. So I didn't think of you much, except when your son came and blew on my back telling me I would be okay. Yet year after year I struggled, though less so with time to be sure, but pain nonetheless and I didn't know what to think. Except the man in my life, the husband by my side, whose kisses fill my nights, who fights with me but takes out the garbage anyway, who plods to work every day. This man who has wrapped his life around mine lays with me in a pillow top bed and I feel for yet a little longer and more closely that you must exist. Except I now do through the wisdom of time that the essence of you is beauty in rhyme. Thank you. If we believe that beauty's in beholder's eyes to see, behold, I grasp the beauty of what your life means to me. The beauty I'm referring to is not just ornate facade, but inner beauty built on love and gratitude to God. There's always more to beauty than what seems to meet the eye. Your innocent sincerity in loving ways shows why. The inner beauty is built on truth, and that you cannot buy. Thus you, my dear, have both of these. Success is yours. Just try. For in you, our Lord God instilled the daring of the wild, and coupled that with love and faith in the gentleness of a child. You bring warmth where cold persists, a beacon in the night, an island in a sea of fear, a harbor of delight. What you should be is what you are, an angel and my dear, a deep and vibrant lover to whom I may adhere. Together, just the two of us, all others just the crowd, we'll show our love on life's grand stage and make each other proud. The others in the balcony will jump and clap and cheer as they see right before their eyes that love's what makes life dear. To steal a gaze in your green eyes will surely mean that I can catch the angel peering out, give thanks for you, and sigh. Expressive eyes transmit your love, all warmth with ne'er a touch. They're windows to the heart of you, the view I love so much. The playful exuberance of your style is mirrored in your laugh. I am most thankful and complete that you're my better half. Your talent as an artist, displayed in all your art, makes glad the eyes of everyone who perceives it from their heart. So it's you, my lovely Valentine, that makes life taste so sweet. It's everything that makes you you that makes life such a treat. Thank you. I'm going to read um, three very short poems. One of them is called Military Wives, and I just listened to one of those reports that you get on NPR every once in a while that are so poignant. Military wives weep in their showers before they brave, clear-eyed into the sunlight. They daydream of grief and a soldier's funeral, and the wife not yet them in black in the beating sun and the shock of a 21-gun salute. A tall mall drove pell-mell to mall hell for a pall mall. <laughs> and here's my uh, poem to my husband that he wasn't my husband at the time when I wrote it, and somehow it turned into something else. I said, well, you don't have red hair. And he goes, don't worry about that. <laughs> so, 
So I went on and finished it. It's called My Love is an Absurd Creature. If his irises can be compared to timid wintry skies, if his trousers at his feet reveal him fair as unbaked bread, if he's clad not but for thick lens that write his myopic eyes, if his hair's a wig ma maker's hell of coarse unruly red, if his smile's not a dashing, more a charming, foolish grin, remindful of a game sheep dog with a bonny bone to bury. Then you have met my love, who gently teases. This specimen requests, my dear, that you describe me as her suit, not Harry. And others cry, go look elsewhere and find you a love more pretty. I've seen their perfect uh, Englishmen with their horses and their hounds. My love has left them coughing dust, for he prefers to drive me with a steady hand, whispering praise, and fearsome, passionate frowns. And though there are times I see indeed he is an absurd creature, one's love should above all love one, my love's most handsome feature. Thank you. Laundry. Gathering all funky smell of dirty, musty, stained stuff, throw and submerge them in white, frosty salt, rubbing and spinning to lift and to free all the unpleasant, unwanted odor and mark to dispel in white salt that walling down, splash cold, crystal clear water to rinse and to wash out still lingering and clinging, uninvited, unwanted smell and stain, hurtful labels and stigma for what I was, what I was not, what I am, what I am not. Laundry, laundry, wash day, not in a washing machine, lure and stream, or bubbly broke, but on my feet, tapping, stumping, dabbing, kisses on earth with my feet circling around, feeling my hair and face brushed by wind, 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 blow, blow hard until I feel free of all self-doubt, shake and shed off these crushed mud and dirt, demeaning thorny levels and stigma that stick on my skin and bone, stop me from growing, bearing raindrops, piss on my skin, rain, rain, Drizzle drop, whip, hide and wash my tears, soak deep into skin and vein, clean and fresh me inside out, quench my longing, plumb my wrinkled, withering heart to suffer and open to taste fresh water and peace. Sensing rising sun, rolled up the starlight sky, lifting my eyelid, calling me on foot, sun, sun, Shine and shine, dissect, let the broken, bruised, shivering body to life. I was told a thousand times, shy away your scorching, bright, blazing light, which my blind sight plant specks of mold on my skin. But when your light feels so warm and shooting, all those rush green flowers and meadows drive and flourish in your light. Why do I need to? Learn and hide away, once young and naive, not trusting my senses and heart, eager to please others, followed others' dictations and expectations. Many faces, many comments weighted me down with fears and confusion. Each steers, fools, entice, terrorize, crushes, and crumbled me into fragmented lump easy to mold their programs and exp explorations, draining out any hope, leaving only faintly flickering light of light to sustain and to carry their wishes. I do not believe anymore all what others say. I'm not afraid. I just woke up and fell off. I see bumpy express train to my grave. I have no place to learn, nothing to lose. Son, 
sun, dazzling sun, shine and shine, deceived, wrapped, broken, bruised, shivering body, head to toe, keep me warm, melt, and my icy frozen, shattered heart, free from all jabs and stabs. Light deep, every fiber and cell, plumb energy encourage me to be self, ever growing, renewing self with each breath to strive for better pleasure, yet strong and persistent as tiny green grassy finger that cut through cold icy snow covered soil, dry and chase out all shadow and darkness drenched worries and creeping, crippling body thought from my mind and heart, lift to spirit, bright and shine as you right, warm, soft to and plappy to plant seeds of hope, love. Laundry, laundry, wash day on my feet. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Dr. Kathy Phillips. And I'm Dr. Andrew Blum. Epilepsy is the third most common neurological disorder in the United States after Alzheimer's disease and stroke. It affects more than 3 million people, with 200,000 new cases diagnosed each year. The condition is caused by a temporary disturbance in brain function, resulting in various kinds of seizures. These seizures can produce involuntary movements, changes in awareness, altered behavior, or loss of consciousness. Epilepsy is a major chronic medical condition and can affect a person's quality of life similar to arthritis, heart disease, diabetes, or cancer. It can limit activity and cause pain, anxiety, or depression. It can also be life-threatening. Because epilepsy can also present non-medical challenges such as discrimination and social stigma, we urge you to learn more about this condition. To find out more about this disorder, including its symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment, visit epilepsyfoundation.org. Whether it's infectious disease, severe weather, or a chemical spill, emergencies that threaten our public health can happen at any time. After the events of 9-11, the federal government established the Medical Reserve Corps to respond to emergencies. Today in the Commonwealth, 45 Corps units recruit and train both medical and non-medical volunteers. In addition, the Department of Public Health's MSAR program, or Massachusetts System for Advanced Registration, credentials and deploys healthcare professionals to respond in such emergencies. Now a new effort is underway to enhance emergency response by aligning the activities of both groups. Mass Response is designed to facilitate emergency medical response and promote local partnerships in planning and assistance. And you, health professionals and concerned citizens alike, can be part of this important effort. For more information on Mass Response and how to get involved, visit maresponse.org. <laughs> 